In 1974, I got to see Balasaraswati perform. She was dancing in Berkeley, California. And I'll never forget the, her con many things. But anyway, first of all, the, her connection to the music, of how her gestures would rise and fall as the notes of the music were rising and falling. The spirituality with which she danced was really conveyed because she was never overdone with the drama. She always matched the drama. And so I came away feeling, what was that? I felt I'd been through some sort of spiritual connection with this utterly beautiful dancer. It was about that same time that Balama was teaching at the Center for World Music in Berkeley. And um, the first day I went to class, there were about 40 women, most of whom had already met her when she had come to the United States previously. And we we're waiting and waiting. Louise Scripps had gone to the airport to pick up uh, Bala uh, the night before. And we're waiting and waiting for some word. And finally, we found out that Balama's plane had been canceled. And she wasn't coming that day. And so we uh, had to go home. But before going home, I looked around at these people. And it almost seemed like a cult. This one woman came up to me and she said, oh, you can't wear those earrings. And I said, what do you mean? She said, oh, Balama will be distracted by those earrings. You can't wear those earrings. And I thought, oh, OK. And I went home to my husband and I said, you know, I'm not sure if this is the teacher for me. Uh, I'm just not quite sure. But anyway, the next day I came into class. And there was Balama sitting with Lakshmi by her side. And Balama asked me, she knew I had done my Arangetram. So she said, please do a Laripu. And I did it as my previous teacher had taught me. And then Balama said, beginning class. I was crushed. In 1976, my husband was doing a Peace Corps training program in Nepal, which was a short flight down to Madras. So that was the first time that I studied with Balama in this home. She was like a mother. And Lakshmi was like a sister for any of us who came to study in India itself. So she made sure we were comfortable wherever we were staying. Sometimes we could stay at the home. Other times we stayed nearby. She always made sure we had good food. I remember the first night she was so worried about mosquitoes. And I said, oh, don't worry. I have cutters, insect repellent. She said, that won't work. That night I was bitten by so many mosquitoes. Next morning she said, how did you sleep? And I said, not very well. She said, today I will get you odomos. So it was always uh, a combination of working with a taskmaster and also with a very caring person. The point is, she was always caring, always thinking, always looking out for us. She was always thinking uh, or planning what would be the best dance for this student. She also used to adjust our arms. I have very long arms. She said, for some people, you need to keep your arms close to the chest. But for you, here, a little bit away. So when you studied with her here in Madras, it was spontaneous. You were never quite sure how much time she could give you or what the class would look like. But you would come here on time. One day, she had a lot of energy. And she said, Aggie, you're not sitting. So in this very same room, I had my class. And there's a, a nook over here, her dining nook. And she said, you do date daha. You do it 20 times. So she sat drinking her coffee. She said, number one, date daha, date daha, date daha, date daha, date daha, and so forth. Coffee. Number two. Number three until I did all 20, and she said, now you got it. To get any approval from Balama was a really big thing. So there were many clever, subtle cues that Balama gave as she was teaching. Lifting her head as a model. We followed whatever she did. Raising an arm 
isn't just raising an arm, it's taking in a breath. while following the hand. Where the hand goes, the eye must follow. When she demonstrated, she would sometimes plan to just take one line of poetry. But before she knew it, she was doing variation after variation after variation, entranced and entrancing us. And then all of a sudden, she will stop and say, how do you like it? <laughs> it, uh, this was either with her, she, she herself singing or with Ramadas also singing. So that's what class was like, looking at Bala, looking for subtle cues. And when we actually did student recitals, rather than being frightened, Balama always sat right in front of us in the audience, very proud looking with a straight back straight head, modeling for us, and just pouring love into us. Who were we? We were just these American students who wanted so much to pick what we could from this beautiful dancer to learn. Balama was very deliberate with how she set up classes in the United States. She was the conductor. Lakshmi was the interpreter of the poetry who would give us detailed notes. Lakshmi had an amazing command of English, Tamil, Bala with Telugu. Ramia, the Natuvanar, uh, would work with us in our talam. Ramadas gave us vocal classes as well as Vishwanathan. And Ranganathan had a group of Murdangam students as well. So when we were at the various universities, Wesleyan, or Duke University or Connecticut College. We had three hour classes in the morning, took a break, and then we had music and maybe Solka two classes in the afternoon for us. To have a quiet moment alone with Balama was a real treasure. I remember once I went with her to Music Academy. We got there a bit early, 10, 15 minutes early, and she typically had her white starched sari on we sat outside in some chairs, a breeze was blowing, and it was just a lovely evening. And she was in a very reflective mood. She talked about how her travels through the world were so important to her dance, that experience is so important. We need to bring experience into our interpretation. She talked about how Bharatanatyam is so vast. It's like an ocean. One can't comprehend its vastness. She also talked about how it has no cultural boundaries. It speaks to every human. And the way to experience the dance is to bring it inside, inside your own experiences, and then relate that to the poetry or the music or whatever. To this day, I find it astounding that such a great artist would have the compassion, the kindness, and generosity to teach a foreign group who followed at her footsteps and took us, almost each one of us, on a personal journey. So to this day, I try to keep it up. When we think of Balama, we think of her as such a great artist, so serious about her music and so forth. But she also had a great sense of humor. And sometimes she would get frustrated when working with American students. So I was in a class with a class of students at Connecticut College. And one of the students said, Balama, do I relax the abdomen or tighten it when I do the Ardamandi and so forth? And Balama said, be calm, not be complex. And we, <laughs> we just laughed. Having a, a particular rigid ideology about what is right and what is wrong. Because <clears throat> 
we're talking about an art form here. And we're talking about an art form that even though has gone from tradition to, uh, from generation to generation, it's always changed. It's the common uh, misconception that tradition is, is the same, mm. that there's a constant, there is a constant. There's a thread. There's a thread. Mm. But what evolves from all of that in each generation has to change. Mm. And what makes this tradition particularly so great is that each generation they've all been renegades in their own way. They've all really, some, in some aspects, completely thrown the tradition on its side and said, no, this is how I'm going to do it. And there's nothing wrong with that because that's the only way a tradition survives. But it's, it's to remember that that one thread that exists as a commonality, to hold on to that and to always recognize that and always use that as a reference point. I personally feel that her technique also evolved throughout her entire career, changed. So when, how she would have danced in the 1930s would not have been how she danced in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. 1950s very different from 1970s. So I think we even saw that reflected in yes, that. Yes, yes, yes. It's not it's not an assumption. Pictures as well. It's not an assumption and it's also a, it's an uh, it's observ observation that I've made through various uh, students who have learned at various times in her life. And what that has taught me is that there's no right and there's no wrong. But what do you do with all of these branches that have sort of evolved? Um, I think it's time to pull everything together and to say this is the tradition right now. And instead of bifurcating it or really completely um, saying aesthetically yes or no, but how to put all of it together and actually create a certain um, image in the foundation and for, for, so people can see that commonality. So it's, it's, it's time to bring in that commonality and that's why having Aggie here, Eva here, Ranjani Akka here, Uma Akka doing what she's doing, um, Nandini auntie of, of what she's done, um, Shamala auntie, yes. my mother. You know, it's not, tradition is not one person. Tradition is everything put together. It's, it's everyone's effort. And it's, that is parampara. Parampara, it has nothing to do with, bloodline is bloodline as a matter of fact and genealogy. But it just does not come from that. That's not how it works. Every, every single student that's learned in this tradition is, is a bloodline of this, is, is, a, is a vein, is an artery of, of the tradition for its existence today.